Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode here in Greg Tech New Horizons. It's taken me a bit of time to put this video together, so apologies for that. But I'm hoping we have a satisfying video by the time we reach the end. Um, we're going to start this off with a bit of a time lapse, showing you some of the changes. You might have spotted some of them behind me here already, if you're really paying attention. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll start with a time lapse and then we'll come back with a bit of an explanation as to some of the changes and new machines around the base. And then at the end, we'll uh, work on some progression and put together the assembly line that we crafted in the last episode. So we're now at the point in the game where we should progress into a new tier. Currently, we're in IV, the fifth tier, and we have been in IV for approximately 40 episodes. Yes, 4-0. It's been a very lengthy stretch to get through the IV chapter. Not only because of its numerous challenges, but also because of the personal goals in moving base from the overworld into the void. But LUV, the next chapter we're moving into, has many of its own challenges. And uh, overcoming these challenges will reward us with many new and improved machines and gadgets. Um, but most importantly, it will bring us closer to this tier 7 rocket. So in the last episode, we crafted our first assembly line, which we'll still need to build and automate. But before we do it, I want to look ahead at some of the first few hurdles in the LUV chapter. The first is Rare Earth, which will break down into two different subsections, RE1 and RE3. And the second hurdle will be Samarium Dust. I'll describe the importance of these two things later on, but for now we need to address the shortage of these resources to make it anywhere in the LUV chapter. So let's begin with Rare Earth. RE Dust we're making primarily from our B, and additionally as a secondary output from processing redstone ore. At the moment we're simply stockpiling the RE Dust, but it needs further refinement. To do that we'll make use of our idle chemical baths. I requested sulfuric acid and hydrofluoric acid to be sent to these machines, along with the Rare Earth Dust. It's quite a simple modification because of the way we have our ore processing system logic built. Um, and these chemical baths will make us both RE1 and RE3. However, we're going to want to control the amount of RE1 that we make since we're really only after one byproduct from RE1. And so to do that, we'll add a level emitter to both machines and tell the sulfuric acid chemical bath to only run when we have less than 8192 cadmium dust and the machine with the hydrofluoric acid to only turn on when we have more than 8192 cadmium dust. This way, once we reach the threshold of cadmium, any extra rare earth sent to the machine will be diverted to produce RE3 exclusively. And we'll just cut out the RE1 production. RE3 is the most versatile and precious, and it's going to be able to give us the resources we need for LUV and beyond, besides cadmium. We'll need to change some of the filters to ensure that the crushed output from the chemical baths takes the most optimal path, which is macerator into centrifuge for RE1 and thermal centrifuge into forge hammer for RE3. Before we move on, I also configured the two other chemical baths that are constructed and waiting to process more crushed ores. One of them is now filled with sodium persulfate. The other machine is now filled with mercury. More on how these are made soon, but these fluids will need to optimally process things like platinum and iridium.
Next, we need to further process the crushed RE1 and 3 that's made in the first two chemical baths. For that, we need some other machines. Some of them we have, but two of them we need to build and assemble. The first machine we're lacking is a forge hammer, and the second is a dehydrator. These are going to go in the unused lane in ore processing, and we'll set up a new filter destination subnet for anything which needs to hit the forge hammers or the dehydrators. Um, and we'll basically just combine them into one stage. I crafted and assembled the multi-block forge hammer, similar to the one we have in the auto crafting system with the thomium anvil inside. And I crafted a single block IV dehydrator, which is the best we can craft at this point in the game. And additionally, I also set up an EV dehydrator, which we had from making rocket fuel. The IV one will be used for RE3 and the EV one for RE1 dusts. So we've tackled the first hurdle in LUV, ignoring the assembly line for now. But the second hurdle that must be addressed here is the Samarium dust. This is something, to be honest with you, I'm not so sure about as things get a little bit messy with its acquisition. Similar to platinum and palladium dust, um, you can set up a cheap and ineffective way to obtain it early on. But later you can improve on that system to give you extra byproducts as well as a more efficient and cost effective way to make the dusts. So there's there's multiple ways to obtain samarium. For now though we'll use the quick and dirty method to get samarium dust, which we'll need for LUV components inside the assembly line. So first up in the chain is a chemical reactor to make dephosphated samarium concentrate dust. Next is an electric blast furnace to cook that dust into samarium oxide dust. And finally, a multi-block electrolyzer for the finished samarium. I put this up in a little space opposite oil processing, just in front of the plat line. If we need to move and upgrade this in the future, I'll probably put it on the opposite end of the base to give us more space. Um, the more efficient samarium processing chain requires many more machines. But for now, I'm hoping this will suffice to break into the LUV tier. Alright, so I just moved the miners onto Europa, which is a planet we haven't been to on camera yet. I mean, well, we were just there, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> all three miners are now on Europa. I placed all three miners on a Ledix vein, and the Ledix vein can give us um, Opal, Ledix itself, which I think we need for the next tier of rocket. 
um, Oricalcum and Rubrasium. And Rubrasium here is what we're after. When Rubrasium is properly processed, this can give us the inputs to the Samarium system, which we'll go over here shortly. But um, yeah, I want to take you guys through some of the changes here at ore processing, because I know that was quite quick. Yeah, perhaps not the easiest thing to follow, so I want to give you guys some more context here. Um, so for Rare Earth, we have added our lane for the Forge Hammers and the Dehydrators. And the Rare Earth we're getting from the Bees and the and Redstone, of course. Hello, Chicken. Actually, yeah, let's start over here at the Chemical Baths. So the Chemical Baths, I, I think I turned them off, actually. Um, but this should start to process all of the Rare Earth, the Thorium, the Sheldonite, Platinum, Nickel, and Meteoric Iron. So the other ones that I mentioned for things like Platinum, we can send Platinum through Mercury to give us some extra Platinum Metallic Powder Dust. And this is the input to our Platinum line. Um, and quite a lot of them are... Nickel is also the same. Nickel through Mercury can give us more Platinum Metallic Powder. So this just supplements the inputs to our Platinum line. But the ones we're after here is the Rare Earth. So Rare Earth through Sulfuric Acid gives us Rare Earth 1. Crushed Rare Earth 1, which we're then processing through this chain here in the centrifuge to give us Yttrium. Yttrium is a very, very important resource as it allows us to mix into Yttrium Barium Cuprate. This one right here. And Yttrium Barium Cuprate we need for all of the LUV stuff in the assembly line. Um, I think it's Yttrium Barium Cuprate cable right here. This is used like all over the place and there's also Samarium right there. So that's just, yeah, one of the major things that we need. One of the other things we need is a molten alloy called Indaloy 140. And this is where the, um, this is where, yeah, this one here, the cadmium comes into play. So there's a couple of different ways to get cadmium, but the, I found the best way is just to use rare earth. Why are we not seeing that cable? There we go. Yeah, it's just to use rare earth one. So Indaloy 140, you make inside the alloy blast melter and we need bismuth. This is one thing I've overlooked, so we need to secure a source of this as well but we should have the rest we need also lead indium dust cadmium right here and tin and this will give us our indaloy 140 for the circuit assembly or sorry the assembly line so yeah these are the two recipes we're doing inside the chemical baths in front of us here the rare earth dust which then becomes crushed when you send it through hydrofluoric this gum this becomes crushed rare earth three and uh, the rare earth one is with the sulfuric acid um, so yeah, along with the yttrium dust, we also get the rare earth one dust. This is different to the input rare earth dust. And uh, similarly for rare earth three, whenever we send this through our thermal centrifuge, we also get erbium. Um, but then we're four chamarin into rare earth three. It's a mouthful. <laughs> I'm not good at this pronunciation stuff, uh, especially for that in my accent. But yeah, those two dusts we then send to the dehydrators. And this makes us a whole bunch of different outputs here. So for every nine rare earth one dusts we send into the dehydrator, we get nine outputs. Um, we also get a bit more yttrium, we get a bit more galena, nether quartz, and then all of these ones we also have to further process. Fortunately, most of them are just electrolysis recipes, and this is how we get our cadmium dust. So it's not a direct recipe in the chemical bath there. And so there's going to be some lag between the time that the the level emitter turns on, um, but that's okay. Buffering a bit more than 8192, which is just an arbitrary number, to be honest. I don't know if that's too much or too little, because we do get quite a lot of indaloy for every cadmium, and cadmium isn't really used elsewhere as far as I remember. So yeah, it's not really a direct recipe, so there's going to be some lag time between when the machines turn on and off, but that's okay. Um, and then the other dehydrator here for rare earth 3 dust is... Um, yeah, similarly, also going to give us nine different dusts as an output. So we're going to want to make sure we can filter and process these dusts accordingly. So I've, I've uh, added the electrolyzable dusts, which is six of nine of these dusts in here, which is pulling from mainnet and also in the storage bus here. Um, no, I haven't. I'm missing... I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm just not going to try to pronounce that. But yeah, having a look at the outputs here, we're getting... A bunch of stuff that we make already, like copper, calcium, uh, arsenic, lanthanum. We don't get any other way, and I think we need this for ZPM, or... I don't know, it's something. Adamantium alloy. That sounds familiar, but we've not used this yet, so... 
some new dusts, but some we have already. Like germanium, tellurium, we don't have any of these, but we have gold and sulfur, of course. What else do we get from this? Uh, bismuth? Oh, oh, there is bismuth here. Yeah, I guess this is going to be our source of bismuth for... Um, I already forgot, for indoloy. And sulfur and then bromine. Bromine is, we don't have a use for, it's basically useless, so it's going to sit cached in the output hatches of the electrolyzers pretty much forever, unless we set up a trash destination. Else it's just going to sit here, like the oxygen, like the hydrogen and water. So long as it doesn't prevent us from uh, processing the rest of the dusts, let's see what else we get here. Iodine and calcium. I don't think we have a way of getting iodine yet, and I'm not sure what this is used for, to be honest. Samarskite, we get more tantalum, niobium, thorium, 235, iron, and more yttrium, which is pretty cool. And then fluorinsite, which is samarium ore concentrate, phosphorus, aluminium, hydrogen, and oxygen. And this samarium ore concentrate is the input to our samarium line. This is the very first stage, which we also get from rubrasium ore. Not to jump all over the place here, but the rubrasium ore, which we get from the Ledex vein, <laughs> we get crushed. I think we are ore washing it. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it should be in the ore washer. Yeah, cr crushed rubrasium here. Um, so that should maximize our chances of samarium ore concentrate dust. Oh yeah, and just while I remember, I have this sign here reminding me this is a brand new interface and storage bus on the chemical bath um, input. And this is for rare earth. So this ensures that any rare earth dust is sent to the chemical baths to go through the sulfuric acid and the hydrofluoric acid to start this whole chain. Because normally the regular dusts, any, any normal dust, any normal dust is prioritized for the outbound, but um, we want a storage destination for rare earth higher than outbound. So I added this storage bus right here. And then the the four chamber and dehydration lane is got the rare earth three, the rare earth one, and then the centrifuge crushed rare earth three, which is what the thermal centrifuge gives us for rare earth three. And then yeah, once it reaches, once it reaches the subnet here, we are just using a stocking input bus to pull specifically this into the forage hammer and that processes it goes back to the outbound and then the regular rare earth dusts are sent to the dehydrators. Okay, so of the nine rare earth three dusts, six of them are electrolyzable and that's the ones we just filtered. The other three have to be dehydrated again, but because we have fluids in the recipes here and we don't immediately need any of these outputs, I'm just going to leave it and we're just going to buffer all of these fluids, or sorry, all of these dusts, these three dusts right here. As I mentioned in the time lapse, it would be nice to get a multi-block dehydrator, but this is a ZPM recipe, so we can't at the moment. But once that happens, we'll swap this out with a multi-block, and then we'll be able to further dehydrate these dusts to give us maximum output. In fact, we might even add a third dehydrator for just these dusts here. Um, but we also need to filter the Rare Earth 1 which is our source of cadmium, or our primary source of cadmium. Yeah, the yttrium we're just going to store. We can mix this into yttrium barium cuprate. The cryolite dust we can electrolyze into more fluorine. This is actually pretty useful. Supplement our crops. The chalcopyrite, I think we're just uh, cooking this into copper, and that should already be filtered. The galena, we can also cook into lead. I'm not sure if that's filtered in our multi-smelter here. Um, it's not, because normally for galena, we are not processing galena and instead we're purifying it and then mix it, or sorry, chemical reacting that into indium dust, which we're doing in this chemical reactor right here, and we'll need that for circuits and uh, even some of the assembly line stuff. So up until this point, we haven't had any gal regular galena dust, um, but yeah, we'll just cook this. We could electrolyze it into more sulfur, but we don't need it, so... Uh, We'll just cook it into into lead ingots. Let's see what else we have here. There's agardite, which we can also electrolyze. Yeah, this is our cadmium source. Also calcium, copper, arsenic, um, oxygen, and hydrogen. So we'll want to electrolyze that one, along with the cryolite. And there should be a couple more. Yttrolite, which is also electrolysis, can give us more yttrium, thorium, raw silicon. And then nether quartz, we're just going to store. And then green octite, I think, is the other source of cadmium. So we can also add these into our 
electrolyzer right here, which should grab the dusts when it comes out of the dehydrators immediately. Right now they're just going into chests, but we need to change that. Uh, there should be interfaces on the machines, which we'll point it, point the output into. I just want to make sure we're filtering the right thing here. And green octite in here, and we'll also add it to these interfaces. We might have to add another interface. Yeah, we're going to be one, one space short. Oh, and we don't have enough item pipe, or at least not any more of this uh, platinum item pipe. Actually, you know what? I was I was messing around with our storage system, just trying to optimize stuff, and I upgraded some of the super chests in primary item storage. Where is it? Over here somewhere? Yeah, here, for red granite. Um, I gave it a super chest 2 instead of a super chest 1, and it looks like it's still empty out here. I also done the same thing for carbon dust, which is empty, and we can take this platinum pipe right here, and also the same thing for salt. Yeah, for salt. Okay, awesome. So that should be all the rare earth taken care of. And I can stop saying rare rare earth. <laughs> oh yeah, chalcopyrite. Did we have that filtered or yes we did. We do have chalcopyrite filtered. So yeah, that should be all the rare earth taken care of until we can upgrade the dehydrators. And the forge hammer I suspect is gonna be Plenty fast enough, so now we can turn on the chemical baths. Right after we change the direction of these dehydrators to send all of the outputs back into the white subnet, and that should send all of these dusts to where they need to go. And we don't need these chests on top here anymore. Send all this back into white. And that should be sent to the electrolyzers already by now. Yes, I can see some of the dusts here. We are going to have to add these into... Yes, some Arskite. We're going to have to add these into the stocking input buses because these are electrolyzed in multiples of random numbers. <laughs> like, not one at a time. So, yeah, we just have to add them into the stocking buses to pull them into the machine. Okay, perfect. We should have them all filtered. Now we can turn on the chemical baths and get rid of all these signs. It was just some reminders for me. Hydrofluoric acid. Yep, mercury <laughs> and sodium persulfate. And that reminds me, how are we making the mercury and sodium persulfate? Apparently we're not making sodium persulfate. Uh, yeah, apparently we're not making sodium persulfate, so let's go investigate. I just want to make sure these dehydrators are turning on, which they are. And this one will only turn on when we have enough cadmium. It's going to take a while, but we should start to build up cadmium dust. Right, 139, 143... So, for sodium persulfate, I've went ahead and added a chemical reactor and a multi-block electrolyzer here. Um, so, these these are missing some signs, but all we're doing here is pulling sulfuric acid and we're pulling salt from our AE system, circuit number 9. And this will give us sodium bisulfate dust, which is then sent on item P2P. Uh, apparently, it's not connected yet, which is, this. I suspect, what the problem is. So, let's name this... Sodium bisulfate dust. And when we bind these two together, that should start the electrolyzer. Any second now. There we go. Sodium bisulfate dust electrolyzed gives us sodium persulfate and also a bit of hydrogen, which is then uh, put into the ME output hatch. And in fact, uh, yeah, actually we don't want this to run indefinitely because that's going to use all of our salt. So we want to switch out the... ME output hatch. Yeah, yeah, we want to switch the ME output hatch with a regular output hatch. Okay, so because this is a secondary output of hydrogen, we want to make sure that we can avoid overflow so that when we're full on hydrogen in this machine, we can still make sodium persulfate. So we're going to avoid overflow here on site. Um, some of you guys have still asked me how I handle void overflow when we have ME output hatches, and we don't. Or I guess we do, but um, to make sure that we don't stop production when we're full on the secondary output we void on site here since remember we don't void in main fluid storage so this output hatch is locked to sodium persulfate and that will go back to the dual interface which we should hide from the interface terminal this one we want to fluid auto output so that 
Oh, actually, this should be a... That should be a fluid storage bus. I'm a little bit rusty. It's been a few days since I've played. Um, by the way, I want to apologize for the length of delay in between the episodes. Um, we're getting there, though. <laughs> we are getting there. Um, there's a lot of complex things that I'm trying to communicate, and to be honest, some of these I'm on, like, the second or third take because I'm just not happy with the way I'm trying to... Uh... This should be hydrogen, right? Yeah, hydrogen. Extract only. Low priority. Um, yeah, when it gets to this stage in the game, it's really, really difficult to communicate um, some uses for all the dusts and where everything is going, especially with AE. It's not always the most intuitive, um, it, especially if you're not familiar with the world. Um, okay, so that should give that should give this a channel now, right? And we should be making sodium persulfate once we turn the machine back on. Yeah, six seconds for nine buckets of sodium persulfate. That's pretty decent. And then as for the mercury, which is the other one, um, we actually have two new machines here. So I set up a centrifuge and also a large processing factory, which is acting like a fluid extractor. So the centrifuge every 10 redstone dust gives us three buckets of mercury, which is a pretty good deal. We're also getting some raw silicon, some pyrite and some ruby dust. And the three dusts are now also being sent into super chests, just so we can void overflow for raw silicon, for ruby, and for pyrite right here. It's not going into the ore processing subnet like pyrite or ruby normally would, but um, I mean that's okay. If, if, we, if we need to use those dusts, we'll set up patterns for them, but it's not really a big deal to be honest. But yeah, as you can see here, 37 seconds, this gives us 72 buckets of mercury because of batch mode, so it handles multiple at a time. And so, yeah, we have stocking bus to pull the redstone, um, and we have output bus for the three dusts, which are sent back to the super chest, and then we have output hatch for the mercury, which is going into a dual interface. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> the reason I have this here, I want to switch this out with a storage bus. That's right, yeah, we want to switch this out with a storage bus because we also have this large processing factory right here. So this we want extract only for mercury. And the reason I'm doing this is because we have two pro producers of mercury. So this will be high priority. Now it should start to buffer in the output hatch. Yes, so the, the primary way we're making mercury is actually not from centrifuging redstone. It's going to be from fluid extracting quicksilver. And Quicksilver we're making from Cinnabar. Cinnabar we can sift, and we're doing that already in ore processing. So Cinnabar, or sorry, Quicksilver we want to pull into this machine, and that's got an ME output hatch. So this will run indefinitely. We don't really need to worry about using all of our Quicksilver because it has no other use. Yeah, we're safe just to fluid extract it all into Mercury. So we're going to do that here, 256 buckets every six seconds. And all of that Mercury goes into main fluid storage. We should have a mercury tank over here somewhere. Or maybe we already had it. It's somewhere here. We have a mercury tank. Is that it? That's refinery gas. Oh, and we're out. We're out of something. Oh, that's diluted. That's that's normal. <laughs> I'm losing track of everything here. Anyways, we have a we have a mer yeah, there's sodium persulfate. There's the main main fluid storage for sodium persulfate. Okay, now I'm actually curious. Where is our... Where is it? <laughs> I don't know where... There it is. Mercury, right here. Yes, Mercury. And then that's pulled into the ore processing subnet. Yeah, that's pulled in over here into the fluid export bus. Export and all these things. And then it's stored via the storage bus in the chemical bath. I also had to blacklist them in this interface between mainnet and subnet as well. Um, so I was finding that for these four fluids specifically because we're sending it into main net or because we're sending it into subnet here I was finding that they were going back and forward. How do I explain this in an easy way? Um, <laughs> basically what was happening here was um, Okay, so we're requesting these four fluids, right? For example sulfuric acid, right? We're requesting it here and the fluid export bus is always going to export it from the main net into the subnet and then what was happening is because we have a storage bus here, this was counting as a valid destination when before these were filtered. So the sulfuric acid would be pulled into subnet. It would see that this is a valid storage destination. 
and uh, it's going back into the dual interface on mainnet so it was just cycling back around and the dual interface sends it away to any available storage on the main net, which is which for us is those tanks over there we were just at. So it was basically just looping around in circles, running in circles, and that's not very efficient for TPS. So to get around that, I basically just added an inverter card here, and we have the sulfuric acid, the hydrofluoric acid, the sodium persulfate, and the mercury. So these are blacklisted in this storage boss. So the only valid storage destination for these four fluids is the chemical baths on the network. And we need to have this storage bus here for the rest of the fluids um, because this is our way of sending the fluids back to mainnet that we get out of the electrolyzers, for example. So you know how we have some cached in here? Like uh, sodium, hydrogen, water. Whenever there's space available in main fluid storage, those are sent from the machines here. Anything with a ME output hatch is sent from the machines through that storage bus. Um, and that interface is, yeah, it's sent through here into this dual interface, which is what we want for those fluids. Um, and then that is sent away to main fluid storage and sent to wherever it's needed. So yeah, there's a couple of new interconnected systems, which took me quite a while to try and figure out here, but we should now start to be processing. That's right, these ones are also turned off. Yeah, there we go. Okay, batch mode as well. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, we're pulling in like, for example, platinum and iridium, like I mentioned earlier, although we don't get iridium ore yet from the miners because we haven't unlocked the tier five rocket yet. But for things like platinum, we can also send this through the mercury. Um, so this one should be our mercury machine. We can send this through mercury to get a bit of extra platinum metallic powder, which is the one of the primary inserts to the plat line. So this is just a little supplementary system to give us some more inputs. And then uh, crushed certus, we are sending through sodium persulfate, and this gives us barium dust, which we also need for our yttrium barium cuprate. So this also goes along with yttrium dust, which we make from the the RE dusts. Um, so yeah, it's all interconnected here, and I'm hoping at least some of that rambling made sense. <laughs> um, it took me quite a while to try and explain all that, so I hope it, I hope I made at least some sense and. Uh, yeah, are we, are we starting to get cadmium now? We are. We have 700 cadmium, which is not too bad, but um, I think I think perhaps it's not got through all the rare earth. It can't have, right? We had like 100k. Yeah, there's still 100k, so I think what's happening is it's only getting any new rare earth, which is coming through the comb processing or redstone processing, which we're not getting right now from the miners. Okay, yeah, so to fix that, I've added a wireless connector, and uh, what we're going to do is request rare earth here, and this should pull any rare earth in any subnet on our system because of the way we have things set up, um, like so, and we're going to send that through a conveyor. We want this on import, and we want to connect it right here. So that sends all rare earth we're pulling from the interface into the white network, into this interface right here. And the white is our main ingest network, so this basically recycles the rare earth back into the system. I mean, it basically acts like we're putting it into the ender chest. We could have set up an ender chest, but this is a bit easier since we don't... I'm not sure we have a spare ender chest. Um, but yeah, we should see all the rare earth now enter the chemical bath here. And so yeah, it's going to take some time, but that 100k rare earth should now be processed in, a, in the most optimal way. And we're just missing a couple of the dehydration steps, which is no big deal at this point. We'll get there when we get there, <laughs> whenever we get to ZPM. All right, so with all the preparations for LUV, naturally the next stages is to get our assembly line up and running. And I want to finish the episode off here by setting this thing up and running at least one recipe through a full length assembly line. I chose to commit to this location underneath the auto crafting intersection here and we should have plenty of space to add assembly lines. We're going to line them up this way and we can expand down and even off in this direction if we need to. But this is going to be, I suspect, plenty of space to get us through uh, the next stages of the game. So, by this point, everything is finished crafting, and we have everything we need here for one um, assembly line full length. 
uh, and we're going to want this fully automated, of course, but there is there is several rules which we have to follow to get this thing operational. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is set up the I.O. of the machine, just to make it a bit easier to explain and to set up, since the machine is going to go on top here. The inputs and the fluids need to go in into the bottom of the machine, so what we'll do is we'll set up a subnet here um, for every single assembly line, and what we're going to set up is alternating cable colours. Normally we use cable colours to um, distinguish separate subnets, but actually these are going to belong to the same subnet in this case. We're just using it so that they don't connect to each other, since we need to have more than 8 channels on this controller here, right here, which is why we have the dense cable, and then we have regular cable here. And we're also going to extend this out a couple more blocks on the left side of the machine. Then we're going to place some storage buses. On the far side, on the left hand side, we're going to have fluid storage buses. And in the middle, we're going to have regular storage buses. So on all the assembly line recipes, we need to insert fluids and items, but it's variable numbers of fluids and items. That should be all, right? Yeah, 16. That was 16 storage buses, so it's 16 long. So let's just make our goal to craft a, an electric motor at LUV. That's the IV1 right here. We want to craft this. Um, so for this recipe specifically, we have two fluid inserts and we have five item inputs. But this can go up to 16 inputs for any given assembly line process, depending on the recipe, which is why we're just making the max size to begin with, just to give us some uh, flexibility. So for the recipe here, if I remember correctly, we need to go left to right, top to bottom, and it has to be in order, right? Um, so we need to give the magnetic samarium rod first, then the long HSSS rods, then the fine ruridit wire, then the 1x yttrium barium cuprate cable. Um, and then also the fluids, indoloy has to be in the first slot and lubricant has to be in the second slot. So what I mean by that is this is slot one, this is slot two, three, four, etc, etc. Right, so to make sure that things are placed in order, what we're going to have to do is set a priority system on the storage buses. So we want all of these on insert only. I mean, insert only doesn't really matter in this case since we're not going to be extracting any items from the subnet. But yeah, we want this on priority 16 or basically the highest priority, um, is going to be the one the on the front. This is the front of the assembly line. So we'll, we'll want priority 16, and then this one is, on, is going to be priority 15. Next one, as you can guess, is going to be 14. Insert only, 13, and so on. You get the idea, right? All the way down. And the last one should be priority one. So this is lowest priority, this is highest priority, and we'll do the same thing for the fluid storage buses. So this one will be insert only, priority four. And there's only ever f up to four fluids, but there can be up to 16 items, right? As you can see here in NEI. So this will be three, this one here will be priority two, and this one is priority one. So that should mean that we should have, uh, when things are sent into the subnet, it's going to be prioritized here. And then because this is is then going to be full, and because the input buses have to be ULV, and ULV input buses only contain one slot, so that's why, for example, we can't just have a IV input bus in the front, and then just shove everything in there. Um, we have to split it up and do one item per slice of the assembly line. So when an item enters this subnet here, this ME controller, which will supply from the main net, um, it's going to be sent to the first, the highest priority storage bus, then this input bus is going to fill up, and then the second priority input bus will be the next slice, and then it's going to fill this input bus, and uh, you can probably see where this is going, right? So it's a very simple and elegant solution to make sure that the assembly line gets the items in order. The only other thing we have to make sure of is that we encode the recipes correctly. So let's point all these down to the storage bus. Unlike the items though, I think the input hatches can be slightly bigger. So we'll just go for HV input, input hatches here. I don't 
uh, I don't think there's a maximum requirement or minimum requirement for the input hatches for the fluid inputs. Um, but yeah, like I said, the items have to be ULV input buses. So when we're encoding recipes for the assembly line process, we have to make sure that things are in order. Um, and so Applied Energistics sends items and fluids in the pattern left to right, top to bottom, similar to the way that the assembly line will demand it in NEI. So it's going to send the Samarium rod first here because it's in slot one of the pattern. And then, uh, yeah, so on and even the fluids. The fluids doesn't really matter since they're separate, but they have to be in order of the fluids shown here. So we have to make sure that Indoloy is first. Um, so Indoloy will be sent before the lubricant. So this is exactly what we want here. Okay, so now that we have our encoded recipe pattern, how do we make sure this is sent to the assembly line properly? Um, well, we're going to put a wireless connector and we'll have to connect this up to our main EE system so that we can request this pattern from our main, main terminal or main wireless system. This blue line is our main subnet connection, so what I've done is put a wireless connector and uh, connected that down underneath here to here, and that just basically acts like we're uh, extending the cable down. So we're on subnet, and then we have a P2P here, which goes back to our main AE controller. So now we're on main net. After, we're, after this P2P, we're on main net. So we're going to connect this wireless connector um, here down underneath the assembly line. So this is now on the orange frequency. Orange frequency, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's on the main network, right? So we're gonna color this orange just to keep us right. So we're now on main network. And so now what we can do is set up a dual interface. This will get the recipe pattern. And then we'll do another dual interface. So we'll have kiss and dual interfaces. So this one belongs to main net. This one is gonna belong to our assembly line subnet. And so we'll have this on, on red. We're also going to have to make sure we can power the subnet as well, right? So we can do quartz fiber and then extend power from the main network, like so. And that powers the ME controller here. And uh, then we have to make sure that, well, we have to make sure that nothing interferes with the assembly line when it's in the process of crafting or when it's in the process of ingesting items, right? So we have to make sure that blocking mode is enabled here. However, blocking mode is not going to work because we're going into another subnet. So blocking mode on its own here only checks the inventory it's connected to. So whenever the items enter this dual interface, like if we put in items here, the moment that that is sent to storage, i.e. the storage buses on slot one, um, then this will no longer count as blocking mode and it will then push the next craft. So if we request uh, two LUV motors, it's going to send the first recipe, and then uh, as soon as the items leave this dual interface, it's going to send the second, and that's going to mess up the, the assembly line, right? So it could be that we have a double recipe, and it ends up all the way back here, which we don't want for the electric motor. So basically, we need to be able to check if there's anything inside the subnet, um, and to do that, we can use the advanced blocking card, which is super awesome. This thing is, I think, exclusive to GTNH. But basically what we want to do with this is uh, put this in the subnet interface um, on here. And as you can see, this gives us a new option here. We can block the interface and ignore circuits um, or blocking interfaces will block any item on this ME system. And for this application, I don't actually think it matters, but basically what the advanced blocking card allows us to do is um, allows this interface to check the whole subnet of any items. So if there's anything in the input buses, because we have storage buses here, um, and actually maybe we don't want this on insert only. Either that or we want report inaccessible items. Um, yeah, because otherwise, if this is on insert only, then normally it doesn't report these items in the input bus. So I think actually we want these on bi-directional. I'm gonna change them all to bi-directional just to be safe here, just to make sure that the blocking card will work when there's items in the input bus. So yeah, again, we want blocking mode on the main interface, the one with the recipe pattern and we want the blocking mode card on the receiving interface, on the subnet um, dual interface. 
And this, this way it only sends one recipe at a time until all of the subnet is empty, i.e. the recipe is, has started in the assembly line, and uh, therefore it should re we should have no recipe conflict whatsoever. Awesome, so we're actually almost there. We only need to set up an output bus, which we'll place next to the input hatches. And this has to go back to the main network, or basically the same network that you have your recipe encoded into. So this we need to connect back to orange. So we're, we're going to have a wireless connector down here. Uh, this has to be colored so it doesn't connect to the cable. And then I realized we can make this a bit more efficient if we move the power over to right here. Put the quartz fiber there and then wireless connector. And that should send the power through the wireless connector. Remember, these act as cable. But we can also bind them, of course, to other wireless connectors, which we'll do. And uh, we'll also color this one orange so that when the assembly line completes the craft, it's going to put the output in the output bus and then send it back to the main network and then sent back to our drives. And that should complete the craft when we request the LUV motor. Additionally, we're also going to want a maintenance hatch on the front. And then we, I think that's basically it, right? We just have to complete the multi-block and give it power. Power is on the top side of the, of the assembly line though, so we'll leave that till last. Um, let's see if I remember how to build one of these things. It's been so long since I've built an assembly line, but I think we want solid steel machine casing. I'm going to try not to look at the preview. Solid steel machine casing down here. And then above that is going to be the reinforced glass. Oh, now, is it going to be assembling line casing in the middle? I think it is, right? Through the middle of the reinforced glass here. And then we have great machine casing on either side. Um, but this one is actually going to be the data access hatch, which is how we teach the assembly line the recipes. And then the machine controller up on the front here. And it has to face this way. We can't have it facing forward, unfortunately. Um, technically, this is forward. Um, so yeah, that's just that's just the way it has to be. And then power can be on any one of these blocks. So we'll have double IV energy hatches to make it LUV power, right? So two amps of IV each. Oh wait a second, we are missing. We are missing something here. That's not right. That <laughs> that's not right. Uh, this has to be. This has to be assembler machine casing here, which is not the same as the solid steel machine casing. Yeah, assembler machine casing all the way through here above the assembling line casing, and then the energy hatch above that. Yeah, there we go. And the rest is just great machine casing. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, this is going to form the multi block once we place all these. Right? We have some spare solid steel, but that's okay. No, it's not okay. That <laughs> that has to go up here. I knew I, I I done the math on this like four or five times, and I was sure I had it all right. And uh, yes, we do. Yes, perfect. Okay, the multi block has formed. Let's do the maintenance. Excellent. And we're also going to want a transformer, so we need to transform uh, from LUV to IV, which we can place right here. We want, I think, one more vanadium gallium, and we'll also want a platinum cable. Uh, any size will do for now. We're eventually going to switch this out with a LUV energy input hatch once we can craft them. But the LUV en energy input is crafted in the assembly line, so we have to go, uh, go with this setup for now. And then plugging it in right here should give us a live power connection. Yes, this has a buffer. And uh, yeah, we should now have a full 16 length assembly line. And uh, I did get, wait, wait a second. <laughs> Who plays this thing? And we do already have the trophy. I picked this up by accident when I was calculating all the blocks that we need for this. So yeah, one more milestone and a request for the tier seven rocket. And so now just to test this thing out. So I wanna make sure we pick up that hempcrete from the input bus. Um, but this should be ready to go once we uh, turn it on. I'm going to wait though. And we are going to request our motor LUV. Ah yeah, we're missing some recipes. And we're also <laughs> missing the data stick for the, for the data access hatch, which is in here. You might remember a couple of episodes ago, we were preparing for the assembly line by scanning a few IV recipes. 
And so I think I've scanned all of them that we need at this point. Yeah, they were scanned on April the 1st. That was a while ago by now. <laughs> but the electric motor should be in here. So this is going to go in the data access hatch right here. Eventually, we're going to switch this out with the advanced data access hatch, which has 16 slots compared with just four. Um, in fact, we might be able to do that just now, but uh, we might just save that for next episode. Let's just go ahead and encode the recipes that we're missing here. So we need samarium, we need HSSS, we need ruridit, we need yttrium barium cuprate, we need indoloy. Run out of space here. Oh, and that actually reminds me, I forgot to turn on the samarium line. And also show you guys the samarium line. <laughs> Not that it's much of a processing line right now, it's just three machines, but... Uh, yeah, we have to request... Oh, I did request. Samarium ore concentrate and calcium. The machine is switched off, of course. This makes us dephosphated samarium concentrate dust. And then it, that sent through the blast furnace, right? Did I request it here? I did request it here. Why are all these machines off? Yeah, that one is that one is actually on. It was just because the first stage was off. This one is off. Oh, this one has maintenance issues. And the stocking input bus here is empty. So this one needs samarium oxide dust. And that should electrolyze for regular samarium, right? Do we need a circuit in this one? No, it's it's uh, five dust for every two samarium. And we get a bit of oxygen as well, which is collected via the output hatch here. I think it already ran a recipe. Um, but we did get four magnetic samarium rods from a quest reward a couple of episodes ago. So we should have, have at least some samarium. Yeah, there's four rods right here, which we need to add a recipe in the polarizer. And we're going to do this 16 at a time. So this will go in our polarizer large processing factory. We also have to turn the dust into... Well, actually, we need a rod recipe as well in the extruder. Let's go ahead and add one of those. We'll do this 16 at a time. So this goes in here. We also need an ingot recipe, which is done in the blast furnace. Circuit number one, MV, 200 seconds, which is pretty lengthy, actually. We'll do the 64 at a time. And this one is going to go in our specialized EBF, the one that handles the circuit one recipes, which is right here. So we'll request samarium dust in this blast furnace. Uh, right now, this is the only one capable of smelting circuit one recipes. Uh, so this one is on the red subnet, so it needs to be in in this one, the specialized one. And in fact, we're immediately going to go ahead and request some samarium. Oh, we don't have enough dust yet, of course, because we d we're doing it 64 at a time. Okay, we, <laughs> we should have enough for at least the motor. Um, let's figure out what else we need here. We are also going to need the long HSSS rod, which is done in the forge hammer. And do we have any more HSSS? Because that's also a EBF recipe. I should have been smelting some of this stuff. We only have nine ingots. <laughs> we need a, also a rod recipe. We'll do this 16 at a time. So rod... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, we're back. No server crash, fortunately. I, I think the game just crashed. Well, I lost connection to the, the server. What was I doing here? Yeah, long rods. Uh, in the forge hammer, the very last slot. All right, also, we're going to need our fine Ruridit wire. We'll do this 64 at a time. And Ruridit is one of those very, very long blast furnace recipes. You might remember I pointed this out when we set up the Vulcanus, and uh, this takes our Krypton gas right here, 400, res uh, 400 seconds, sorry, for one ingot. I should have had some of this smelting as well. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to just start it. Oh, and we're missing Ruridit dust. Yeah, see, this is what happens when you enter a new tier. There's so many different new recipes and materials. Um, I think this is a mixer recipe, right? Iridium plus ruthenium, which is two outputs from the platinum line. Hopefully you guys are seeing where all this is coming together and all of our preparations are paying off. Besides of requesting the EBF recipes, I should have had this done. But regardless, we're going to send this uh, in a mixer. We'll do it 48 at a time. And this is mixer circuit one. So we'll add that here. The fine wire is circuit three in the wire mill. And I think it was two stacks for the the motor. I'm just gonna go ahead and request that. So it's gonna smelt a full stack of Ruridit. And that should happen in the Vulcanus. 
Let's just make sure it's cooking here. Yeah, 47 seconds for eight ingots. We're getting, we're saved by the Vulcanist because of its parallel capabilities. And of course we have our mega vacuum freezer. So actually it's not gonna take that long. Um, let's see what else we need here. We need yttrium barium cuprate cable. So we need a recipe for yttrium barium cuprate, which is circuit number two in a mixer. And we should have our yttrium, we should have our barium by now, and we should have copper. We also need oxygen in the recipe, but the way that we have our mixer set up, uh, this mixer right here should be automatically supplied oxygen. And yes, it is. We have oxygen gas being supplied in the mixer. So this is going to get circuit number two. That's circuit one, four, three, two, right here. Yttrium barium cuprate. Okay, next we also need an, another EBF recipe for yttrium barium cuprate. This is also circuit number one. Uh, so that'll be the same situation as we just done for Ruridit. And in fact, the Ruridit recipe might be wrong. Or no, I mean the uh, Samarium, which is actually correct. I thought this gave us, gave us a hot ingot, but actually it doesn't give us a hot ingot. Um, so the recipe here is correct. And we just have to add the Yttrium Barium Cuprate in here. Yttrium Barium Cuprate Dust. I think there is also quests for all this stuff, but we're going to ignore that for now. We'll pick up the quest later on. Um, but we also need a recipe for Indoloy 140. And I prepared ahead of time for this as well. So this is circuit number... Uh, circuit number five in the alloy blast smelter, bismuth, lead, indium, cadmium, and tin. And just after I set up the samarium line, I also went ahead and added another alloy blast smelter for indoloy specifically, um, mainly just so we could get extra circuit numbers. So now we have two alloy blast smelters, and this one back here should be ready to receive the recipe with uh, circuit number five, right? No, I didn't set circuit number five here. It should be circuit number five. I named the interface circuit five. And yeah, that's that's turned on. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Is that us ready to craft the motor? We have our long rod. We have our samarium. We have rivered it. Oh, we're missing the cable recipe, right? That's right, for yttrium barium cuprate. That's just an assembler and a wire mill. Wire mill. And assembler. Circuit 24 and wire mill circuit number one. Okay, how close are we now? Samarium and barium. Mm, barium is one of those things we get from nether quartz and our miners have not been on nether quartz. So uh, yeah, I guess we don't have any barium. We might have barite though. And barite we can also get from nether quartz and certus quartz, which we have been getting. So. I think for barite, we just have to electrolyze. Yeah, six barite can give us some extra barium, so we're going to do that. I'm just going to send this through the electrolyzers. And in fact, there's no other use for barite, is there, other than to electrolyze? No. So we're going to actually add these to our electrolyzer stocking buses. And then uh, we're also going to just set up the filters here in the electrolyzer. We'll add this to the storage bus, and we'll add this into here. And that should electrolyze all of the barite in our system, which already exists. And that should give us the barium. And then the samarium is just a, well, just a patience issue. <laughs> because it's trying to craft the, it's trying to craft the magnetic rod, right? And it's trying to do it uh, 16 at a time, which we don't have. But we do have four samarium rods already. Yeah, we do have four rods already. We're slowly building up on samarium dust. The four rods I'm just going to do manually. So these have to be made magnetic in the polarizer right here. It's going to be one of the input buses. Let's just feed it to the machine manually, just so that we don't have to wait for 16. That should run the recipe, right? Yeah, one, two seconds to run the recipe. That's pretty decent. Um, so so now we should have all, all that we need, right? Now we can request our motor. Yes, perfect. Okay. So it's going to craft the HSSS rods, it's going to craft the yttrium barium cuprate, it's going to craft the indalloy. This is awesome. Okay, let's start this and we should see it in the assembly line. Uh, we are waiting on yttrium barium cuprate. 56 seconds an ingot and we only have one EBF on the job and it's going to try to craft a full stack. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to... Uh, uh yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to just do this manually like the samarium. We're also going to add a new fluid storage tank for Indoloy 140. Right now it's just being cached in the ME output hatch of the new alloy blast smelter. 
um, and we want to give it a storage destination just in case we want to use the alloy blast metal for something else. And uh, in case we cancel a craft and repeat it, it's not going to count as storage in the AE system, so it's going to craft a new batch. So yeah, essentially we just need to give it a storage destination on the network. And this is going to be filtered for Indeloy, high priority, and bidirectional. So that should give, that should fill up actually once we, or maybe we already have a tank for it. I'm, I'm genuinely confused right now. <laughs> that should, that should have stuff in it, right? Because the ME output hatch, uh, I don't know where that went. Unless it's still in the, oh wait a second, is the craft still active? No? Wait, does it exist in the system already? Yeah, 14k, where is that being stored? Because it sure, <laughs> it sure as heck ain't in this tank. <laughs> I don't, maybe I already added a tank for it? I I don't know, I, I have no idea. I really wish we could have, like, storage monitors, but those take a channel, unfortunately, and that would mess with all the wiring here, so... I, I don't know what the solution is, other than, like, regular signs, maybe, but that's not really... Yeah, that's not exactly ideal. Regular signs, I kind of want to get away from those. Yeah, we don't have any indeloy storage, so where on earth is that being stored? <laughs> okay, you know what? Let's uh, craft a fresh batch. I I don't know where that first batch is, to be honest. But there is an ME output hatch here, so it should go back to that tank. Um, other <laughs> I'm so, so confused right now. Unless there's like a secondary tank somewhere else or a fluid storage disk on the network or I have no idea what's going on. But we should see it in the tank here now that it crafts. Is that it? No, that's boric acid. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Where is the first 14k? I have no idea, but yeah, that should be... Okay, um, that should have given enough time for the yttrium barium break cable. And now we can request our motor, right? Now it's just going to straight craft. And it should drop it into the assembly line. Right. Inside here should be samarium. Yes. Next one should be long HSSS rod. Fine ruridit wire times two. And then finally the yttrium barium cuprate cable. Oh, and it... Oh, this is, uh, this is not formed on the... On the back here. I wonder if it's because of the... Output bus, maybe that has to go on the end. I think that's the case actually. Let me move the output bus to the end of the machine. We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll color this. Replace the multi block and connect this to the output right there. Ah, yeah, now, now the. Yeah, now it's full length. Yeah, now it was only uh, recognized up to here because this is the out. This was the previous max size. Because the output bus, I guess, has to be placed on the end of the machine. So now we have a max size assembly line. And uh, we should be able to turn this on. We have the data stick in there, so it should run the recipe for the LUV motor. Fingers crossed. 15 seconds. Oh, this is so... This is glorious. Guys, we did it. <laughs> we did it. We did it. We, we, we didn't get the quest, though, because uh, we're missing the LUV machine hull. But we'll get that next episode, and uh, because we need to craft the rest of them, right? We need the robot arm, the conveyor, the piston, the pump, which does have a couple of extra recipe requirements, but nothing out of the ordinary. Niobium, titanium, we can craft. Um, yeah, nothing insane. It's just um, more HSSS in various forms. Um, a lot of it is all the same. Styrene, butadiene, we have this. More yttrium, barium. The same fluids, at least for the, the beginning LUV components. But yes, the first motor at LUV, oh my goodness, the first pink motor. <laughs> we did it, we did it. We have we have our first LUV stuff. We are in LUV now, we are in LUV. Oh, this feels so, so good. I really, really need to know what happened with this end alloy though. But um, yeah, we're going to wrap up the episode right here and uh, we'll come back next time. I don't know how long this is going to be, by the way. So apologies for that, but I was... I was, we were just kind of on a roll there trying to get this up and running, <laughs> which we did. And yeah, we're going to upgrade this next episode. We can add the data hatch. We can upgrade the power situation and we can craft a bunch of stuff in the LUV tier. I do have to mention though that um, just before I started messing with the assembly line, some of you guys who were really, really paying attention might have noticed the mistake here, but the lev limiter 
used to be connected to the white network, but we don't have any storage on the white network. So um, this thing was going to run indefinitely. Fortunately, I noticed quick enough and it's now placed on the green network. Um, and the green network is the main ore processing outbound storage network. Uh, this one here for outbound, which is where all of the storage is. And that is where all of the cadmium is stored. And therefore we can read a correct quantity of cadmium and therefore stop the machines. I've also changed the amount here so that uh, this is still 8192, so it's going to run until we have 8192. But it's going to split up the rare earth, and we're going to start to make rare earth 3 when we have above 2048 cadmium. So, yeah, we're down to 77k. Still quite a bit to go, but all the other crushed is now processed in the, the other fluids, the mercury and the sodium persulfate, which is pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, our miners are going to keep running... I did have to add a bunch more filters. There was some unfiltered material here, I think auricalcum, um, but I just added that to the macerator and yeah, it's gonna keep running the recipes, keep processing materials. Um, there's still quite a while to go though. It's only on chunk seven and eight. It's actually relatively slow, but yeah, it's a, it's a steady trickle of resources, which is what we need. Our sulfuric acid though is definitely a bottleneck because, oh, it, it actually has maintenance issues. This is definitely a bottleneck because we use this in sodium persulfate, we use it in the chemical baths, we use it in phthalic acid, I believe, um, for bee comb processing. We use it in the plat line, so this is this definitely needs an upgrade very, very soon. I also upgraded the plat line here with this uh, advanced fluid extractor. This used to be MV, it's now EV, but it might become a large processing factory very soon because this is one of the biggest bottlenecks in processing platinum. We have 57k platinum metallic powder dust unprocessed and only 23k regular platinum. So yeah, we could do with a few more upgrades here. Ammonia is another big bottleneck. How's the Samarium line doing? Are we still processing? Yes, we are. 15 seconds for the dephosphated, so it's kind of slow, but um, yeah, this is only running EV right now. We might bump it up to IV. I'm not so sure. Yeah, that end alloy situation, I really need to know what happened there. <laughs> I really need to know. This is only, it only uses an ingot of indoloy, and somehow we have 14.4, which is the, the full recipe worth. I have no idea what happened. Like, that is a full, that is a full recipe. We crafted two, and we only used 144, so where did the other one go? Anyways, guys, that is going to do us for this episode. I saved the chicken. I think I cut it out of the last episode, but this is the guy who was in the, in the overworld, so he now lives. And oh yeah, oh yeah, I <laughs> I have to show you guys this. So one of our one of the patron, I know I just said we were going to wrap up, but I just I was just reminded after I seen that chicken, um, and this chicken in ore processing is still here, and I have to show you guys this new creation by Ruba, one of our amazing Patreon members. Check out what he made, it's so so good. <laughs> oh, it just puts a massive smile on my face that. Thank you, Ruba, for that, and yeah, thank you everyone for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.